Thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Wilson. Uh, I'm a, a, academically, I'm a, an historian, um, but I sort of branched away from that and moved into uh, being a bit more of a folklorist. Um, so that's kind of my, my background. Uh, my specialism is in uh, early medieval, what used to be called the Dark Ages but we now call the early medieval period um, and pre-Christian uh, Anglo-Saxon Jutish um, uh, belief systems, uh, which is a fairly narrow field only because we don't have a huge amount of information about it. But, um, you know, it's, it, it's something that I've always found fascinating and um, it, it is the root of a, a, a lot of our, um, modern day folklore so that's 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 kind of my background in, in summary so tonight we're going to be talking about the yuletide or, or, or a pre-christian yuletide or what would have been said in um <clears throat> excuse me uh what we would have called jiola which is the uh jutish or anglo-saxon for for Yule. Um, so how much do you think we know about pre-Christian Anglo-Saxon and Jutish Yule traditions? Um, I'm going to start out by saying that we know virtually nothing. Uh, if anyone ever tells you that they're an expert on it, then they're either uh, a liar or they have about 10 minutes worth of content to talk about, really. Um, so that's kind of sounds like it's going to be a rather short talk. But uh, I think if we can use our imaginations a little bit and um, use a little bit of uh, uh, know-how, we can come up with something that the early medieval uh, people may, they may not know, but they would kind of un uh, recognize in part. Um, so let me say, though, that before we start... There are no straight lines here. There are no arrows showing us the way. Everything is crooked. Everything's hidden behind a mist and layers and lenses that distort and trick us. Every bit we uncover is out of focus and subject to mass, massive interpretation. An historian is dispassionate, but a, story, but a storyteller is not constrained by that rigid definition. So tonight this is about storytelling as opposed to <clears throat> straight out um, history. So with that being said, let's travel back to the fifth century. What we now call Great Britain was in chaos. It was falling to pieces. Uh, the, the old guard had fallen away. The, the Roman Empire that had held sway over many centuries had gone the country or the province had fragmented the britons themselves had frag fragmented and there were invading forces over the course of time the germanic tribes made their way across into the land and with them their belief systems came and their traditions their belief systems that were not so far different to the Britons, to the native Britons, but in other ways, very different. So everyone has heard, I assume everyone has heard the story of Hengist and Horsa, sons of Vorden, and who, how they conquered the Kentish people and set up the beginnings of the Germanic kingdoms. They were Jutish. Horsa was killed during the battles and Hengist survived and set up the kingdom. With them, they brought their gods and goddesses and, well, more correctly, what they would have called the Athens. Uh, for the idea of godhood is a far more complex um, idea than what we would understand today. I'm not going to go into huge detail about this. We don't have the time. Um, but if anyone wants me to talk about this subject in more detail, 
you know who to speak to and you know ask her to to have me on again and maybe we'll do we'll do something about that so let's <clears throat> this part is just to give you some background knowledge before we get into the 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 major part of uh, of the stories and things that we're going to talk about so what are the Eatons? the Eatons or the entities uh uh the the ilfi or the the elves the spirits the osa the ven what are the, these terms? What, what do they all mean? Well, it, we'll, we'll start with the, with the Issa. The Issa were like the big gods. Voden, Tunor, Frigg, Tiu, Ilan, Lok, Ven, um, Ingufrey, Freo. The, and, and some of those names you may kind of hear you, you may be familiar, so it's Dunor is cogn cognate to uh, Thor, Voden, or cognate to Odin, uh, Ilan, who is cognate of Hel, Lok, cognate of Loki. So th there is this um, uh, sharing of stories. And then there's more abstract ones. There, there is Ostir. There is Gita, so there, there there are other there are these other ones. That, so there the Ven, the Ven is Ingolfria, Frio or or Freya, you would know as Freya. Um, Neoth, Ostir, Gita, Other or Earth, Nih, Night, you know Sigel, Moon, Undeguth, or the Under God, the God underneath. So there, there is this pantheon of gods or, or entities. And then we move into the Ilfi, the elves. And then not elves that you would think of in the modern sense, little pointy-eared little um, creatures who hang around with a fat dude that lives in the North Pole. These guys, you know, Ilfi are different. And they have... and but they're on the, they're in the same category as Eten. So they would have worshipped the Ilfi as well. There's Modre, the Modre, the, the mothers, the Woskfreya, the Valkyrie, or cognates of the Valkyrie, um, Kuma, Hika, and Bill. The, the, so there are all these wonderful... Um, characters and some of these play part in 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 the uh giola uh tales that we're going to talk about so there is a story that says that when hengist traveled to the wit the isle of wight he arrived on what was called the modrath the night of the mothers and he met the modre the three women, the three mothers, who manifest themselves on the island in the three rivers, the Eastern Yar, the Western Yar, and the Medina. And while he was here, he anointed the wild ponies that roamed the wild islands, the road that roamed wild on the island at the behest of the Modre. And legend says that um, the, 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 there's a tradition in Kent called the hoodening, the wooden horse. On, it's a horse on a pole, uh, which is, was incorporated into mama's plays and all sorts of things. But the legend says that it originated from the Isle of Wight and originally was called the Wodening, the Wodening, the Woden's horse. And these were the horses that were anointed on what we now call Christmas Eve. So the Modra night, the Mother's Night, was the 25th, around about the 25th of December. So it was almost bang on, and could well have been bang on Christmas. So that's our background. That's, they're the ideas that I want you to have in your mind as we, as we sort of press forward. So what do we have? 
the Giola celebrations. So our primary fo- our primary source on this is the Venerable Bede or Bedda, as uh, more uh, is the correct way of, of pronouncing it, Bedda. And um, keeping in mind that like everything that Bedda um, conveyed, it comes through a Christian lens. So whether you're looking at the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, whether you're looking at uh, Venerable Bede's writings, whether you're looking at the Nordic um, Eddas, even Snorri Snellinson, who, who wrote the Icelandic Eddas, was writing through a Christian lens. So anyone that ever says this is the definitive work is missing out on the fact that, you know, we are taking this outside of context. So what we know has come from Bedda. What we would like to believe is coming through this filter, this this mist that I spoke of earlier. So what is um, so what is Giola, what is Giola, what is Yule, depending on where you were in the country was how you pronounce it. What, what is Yule? Well, it's a period of time and not a celebration. We now know it as interchangeable with Christmas. However, the clue is in the full name, Yule Tide, the Yule Time, the time of the Yule. The word Yule comes from Giola. So December, to the Anglo-Saxons, December was called Ela Giola, before Giola. January was called Eftira Giola, after Giola. So it was a time, but it was an abstract time. It was a time that had things going on in it. And... Um, there was no concept of uh, of it being a an exact start and an exact end. These concepts weren't um, something that was in the forefront of their minds. It was an abstract thing. But we could kind of say that uh, the the celebrations probably probably started in uh, late November, moving into December, ramping up to what we now call the winter solstice. Huel. They called it Huel. The wheel. The beginning of the Eftweird. So those of you that know anything about... um, uh, Anglo-Saxon idea of the universe. Everything sort of centered around the weird. It's wrongly um, translated to fate because it's something more than fate. The weird is more like a river. A river that has points along it that where it bends and you can't change those points. But it splits, and sometimes it's fast, and sometimes it's slow. But it's a it's what it's a river that goes into a fog almost. So you can see a little bit. Seers can see a little bit into the future, but they can't see all the way. Now the Eftweird, the Eftweird is the end of the weird. Again, not a concept that. Um, not 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 the idea of the end of the world like we would have now or armageddon or any of that sort of thing the f to weird the end of the weird the end of a cycle so the whale the whale the winter solstice was the wheel of life that was the f weird coming to the f weird the beginning of it the beginning of the end of the year and that's when the spirits were more likely to to come close to this world it was a time when 
like we do today. I mean, we still today think of this time as a time of ghosts. It was a time of when the ancestors would come. And it was a time of darkness. And that darkness is very important. Because all through Anglo-Saxon uh, culture and thought processes is this idea of the winter. And everyone, everyone knows about Game of Thrones. The winter is coming. That's lifted straight out of, of Anglo-Saxon belief. The winter is coming. I mean, it wasn't said directly like that, but it meant the same thing. The winter is coming. It's a concept rather than an actual thing. Yes, the winter is literally coming. But the concept is something more. It means something more than just uh, a, a, a literal um, season coming. And they had what was called the concept of the the winter sirig, the winter sirig, the winter sorrow, the sorrow brought on by the winter months, or the passing of too many winters. And this is so important to this whole idea of the Jeola. Because without the darkness, there is no light. Without that darkness, there is no redemption. So, and, and, and you can see how this idea slipped in very neatly into the whole idea of Christianity. Because without the sin, you can't have the redemption. Without the dark, you can't have the light. You, you need to have that darkness to see that shining light. And that's what this time is all about. We think of this period now as joy and happiness. But for them, it was sorrow and darkness. But with that promise of light that sets just off in the distance and everything they did was to bring that beautiful light to them. 25th of December. Modren night. The mother's night. The night of the three mothers, the Modre. The protectors of Imrunsal. Imrunsal, the tree of life, or a pole, I guess, or a pillar, the pillar of life. Um, the three mothers, one, the creator, the second, the protector and nurturer, and the third, the wisdom, the first, the youthful. The second, the mother, the 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 um, the the nurturer of children, and the last, the crone, the three manifest manifestations of womanhood, and that's the core of Mother's Night. But also, it, it's a complex thing that it, it's layered because it's not just about one thing. We think about Christ we, we think about Christmas as being about one thing. But it's not not in in something can be multi layered in the Anglo Saxon psyche. It can be multiple things and they can be layered and they can be just as as relevant and they can work together. So we have the three mothers and the celebrations of those we can only speculate. But we can see what they became. So not only do we have that, we also have Frigia, or Frigg, the mother goddess, the wife of Woden, the queen, the queen of the Issa. Frigia, whose symbol is mistletoe. She also is celebrated at this time. In many ways, the Anglo-Saxon belief system is very much a female worshipping uh, belief system. There is a lot of uh, female worship. Um, uh, all we kind of hear about is, you know, the Thunor and the Voden and all that sort of stuff. And 
and uh, Whalen and all those guys. But there is still the, the, there is the um, divine feminine is very important, which leads us on to Voden himself, who is also very much um, uh, thought of at this time. The, there is the Voden worship. worship. The Jula Ethle, the Yule Father, an incarnation of Voden, long beard, long white beard, white hair, older, a crown of holly and ivy, a precursor to Father Christmas, perhaps, maybe. And this was a very important symbol of this time as well, because it slots right into the wild hunt. And very apt that uh, uh, David wearing his uh, antlers for Hearn the Hunter. Very important at this time because Voden, the horned one, very often depicted with horns. A lot of people know that Odin or Odin or Voden will be depicted with one eye because he had his eye, he plucked his eye out. But also the horned one, the horned god. And that's where the idea of Vikings with their horns came from. They never wore them. Odin or Voden, the horned one. So that in itself brings us on to how did they celebrate? Well, forget your turkeys. There wasn't any. Turkeys came from the New World. Forget your geese, forget your birds, forget that whole idea. No, this was a wholly different type of celebration. We'll start off with the Jola boar, the, the wild boar, the wild hunt. Part of the celebration was going out and getting that boar. It wasn't a just a pig that they had, it was the getting of the wild boar and that brings us to two other entities that we'll talk about two Itans so we have Freya or Freya as you may know Freya uh, the she was the goddess she's a goddess of divinity of divination fertility her twin brother Frey Ingo um, so she's the twin sister of, of Freyinga. She was called the Lady of the Ilfe, the Queen of the Ilfe. Freyinga, he was the god, uh, god of fertility and rain, Lord of the Ilfe. And their symbol was of the boar. And of course, they too were probably celebrated at this time, for the boar was an incarnation of both the sacred feminine and the sacred male. Catch the boar was... So the idea of sacrifice to the gods was not really something that... It's not what we think of today. So we have a very um, Judeo-Christian slash... Um, uh, Islamic view on what uh, sacrifice would meant. The interaction between the gods and humanity was very different. Praying was a different concept. There was not this direct relationship. But the act of going and getting that boar was as much a celebration to those gods and a thank you to those gods. One for providing that, but also a celebration of the, that duality. Which brings us to the, the the second part of the wild hunt, the Jula log, the Yule log. Maybe a representation of Ermensa, the tree of life or the the pillar of life. It was about bringing light back. It was about warmth and heat and that beautiful flash of light from the future that was coming to bring back the sun goddess herself to bring her back to this world 
It was about the warmth in the da- warmth in the darkest and coldest part of the year. And again, without that darkness, where can that redemptive light come from? Which brings us to the story of the log and Thori. Thori, a Ilfe, I guess, a, a creature of maybe a precursor to what we would call um, uh, Jack Frost, perhaps. So one evening, a man sets out on, mo- on the Mother's Eve to find a Yule log. It had been a very strange year that year. It was mild, no sign of snow. Of course, it had cooled down and the darkness was there, but the chill was not. And so he walked and he walked and he walked. He walked to try and find a fell log sufficiently large and dry enough to bring back home for the Yule log. But alas, as he walked, he found nothing. As he walked, the crunching of the leaves, still fresh on the ground, crunched under his feet. But there was none of the slight, delicate crunching of the snow. And in his heart of hearts, he longed for what should have been there. Eventually, after many hours and the daylight slipping from him, he decided it was time to walk into parts of the wood that were unknown to him. And he set off. Against his better judgment, he set off. And the woods became thicker and thicker. And he felt he was walking in circles, but he did not know. And then as the woods crowded in lower and lower and the sounds around him became duller and duller, he felt a coldness, a mysterious coldness. But he plunged on and he walked and he came to the conclusion that he was lost. But he couldn't go back because he didn't know which way was back. The ground had was solid, so he didn't know where his footsteps had been. So he walked on, exhausted, cold, and then first hints of flurries as he got thicker into the woods mysteriously the snow started to happen it started to fall strangely about him in this cold dark place the night was closing in the snow was closing in and the cold was biting deeply He felt that if he couldn't find shelter soon, he would surely die. He fell to his knees and dragged himself through till he came to a ridge. And before him was a strange door. A door was built into the side of the ridge. He banged on the door with all his might and nothing. He hit that door with his fists until they bled and nothing. He called out into the night and nothing. He flopped down, exhausted, his body at the end of its tether. And leaned against the door and the door quietly opened the man in amazement pulled himself through and there at the other end of this hall what did he see he saw a great fire ablaze with radiating heat he couldn't believe his luck 
He lay down in front of it, letting the heat penetrate every pore of his body, and eventually he fell asleep. He fell into a deep, deep sleep as that warmth wrapped him like a warm woolen blanket. After what seemed hours, he awoke refreshed and warm, and he looked at the log. The log was still ablaze, but it had seemed like it had not burnt at all. The man looked. He couldn't believe it. And the other, the next mysterious thing was, it was didn't even seem to be charred. He grabbed his axe and pushed it in and tried to move the log. And as he did, he slipped slipped forward from the wetness that was still around his axe and found to his surprise that the log didn't burn him. It radiated heat, but when he touched the log, it was cool to the touch. At this point, he realized it must be an enchanted log. And he thought to himself, if I could only get this log out and I could take it with me, it would warm our house forever. He grabbed his ropes and he ran, ran them round the log. Tied it tight. They did not burn. And he started to pull. And he dragged the log out of the house, through the door, out of the house. But to his despair, he realized he had nowhere to go. He did not know which way was home. He sat down again. He kicked the log. He heard something. No, that can't be. He kicked the log again and he hit ew. He kicked the log again. Don't kick me, said the log. You can speak, said the man to the log. To his, to his surprise, the log came back and said, Sir, I'm the imp Thori. I'm the bringer of frost. I was captured by a wicked sorcerer who imprisoned me within this log. He used his magic. He uses my magic to ensure that this log will burn forever and never run out of fuel. But if you promise to free me, I will show you your way home, for I know always. And you'll be able to keep this log and warm your family. The man thought about this for a second and said, How do I know you won't just run away if I free you? Thori said, Bind me. Bind me with your rope. And I will help you drag the log. So the man agreed to the terms, and Thori explained to free him the man needed to pile enough snow on the log until it snuffed out the flames, at which point he could grab Thori and bind him with the rope. So the man set to work. As instructed, and after many hours, he had constructed a, a, a small hillock of snow and snuffed out the flames. But just as he finished, the sorcerer returned and confronted him. Stupid man! Do you realize what you have done? Said the sorcerer. I captured that Thori to ensure he would no longer blight us with snow and ice. And just as he spoke, both men heard a laugh coming from within the pile of snow. And then above them they saw... The blue eyes, the blue icy eyes of Thori. And they felt his cold words upon them. Thori laughed at them and looked down. And at that moment, Thori vowed from that day on, he would never come when people would expect. He would only come of his own accord so that he would never be trapped again. Then he flew around and around, chanting their names until they were both frozen. And he flew off 
to spread his cold mischief. Where and when he could and whenever he wants. And that is what they call the Winterkrieg. Not a um, traditional Christmas story. The stories that were told didn't have to be happy endings. And I chose this because it illustrates the idea of what this time was. And it brings us to the last part of the celebration of this time. The Jule Goat. Something that's gone out of fashion. We don't really see the Yule Goat in um, the Anglo world anymore. The the Jule Goat was could possibly have represented Thunor. Thunor was known to ride a goat or have a, a chariot that was pulled by a goat. Or it may go back to, um, to uh, representing Volden, the horned one. But either way, it was part of the wild hunt. And all these parts were spread out over days. You know, we have the the notion of the twelve days of Christmas now, and they had this had a similar one then. We don't know how long it went, but we know it was an ongoing concern, and it was part of the psyche of everyone. The whole village, the whole area, would be involved, and the. The Jola goat was the last part. That was the, the the representation of the puck. The goat legged man, the horned man, the magic. The first moon, first full moon of in the January is called the Puck Moon. For that very reason, because it was the representation of the new life, the new weird, the eft weird was over. The sorrow brought on by the many months of winter. And which brings me to the last part of my talk. Just a little bit tiny what we sadly don't have anymore is any of the anglo-saxon poetry around this time but we have glimpses of it my very everyone knows beowulf and everyone knows it's the most famous of the anglo-saxon poetry sagas the biggest the most complete but certainly not my favorite but even that in itself has references to Volden, has references, references to the cold, the darkness, the redemption that comes after that darkness with the defeating of the Grendel, defeating of the Grendel's mother. My favourite Anglo-Saxon poem is called the Irstepper, the Earth Stepper, the Wanderer. And it is very much about being in that place of desolation. But tonight I'm going to pick a different one, the seafarer. And the seafarer is probably the closest that we have that talks about this time of year. So I spent a uh, few days doing a, a bit of a translation and I thought you might enjoy it I can make a true song about me myself and tell my travels how I often endured days of struggle troublesome times 
the troublesome times, how I have suffered grim and sorrow at heart. I have known in the ship many worries below and above all care the terrible tossing of the waves where the anxious night's watch oh, often took me to the ship's prow when it tossed near the cliffs fettered by cold where my feet bound by frost in cold clasps when then cares and scares seethe hot about my heart but none so weary as the deepest of winter a hunger tears from within the sea weary soul this the man does not know of whom on land it turns out most favourably how I, wretched and sorrowful, on the winter cold sea, dwelt for the ice, and for and long, the forever lasting winter. For it comes, and it comes, and in the paths of exile bereft of friendly kinsmen, hung about with icicles hail flew in showers there i heard nothing nothing but the roar of the sea and the ice-cold waves at times i thought i heard the swan's song i took to myself as pleasure the gannet's noise and the voice of the curlew but instead of the laughter of men, the singing of the gull, instead of drinking of mead, storms there beat the stony cliffs where the tern spoke, now but icy feathered always, and never the eagle cries, dewy feathered, no cheerful kinsman, no ke cheerful kinsman can comfort this poor soul. Indeed, he credits it little. The one who has the joy of life dwells in the land and in the village, far from this terrible journey. Proud and wanton with wine, as you celebrate this time. But woe for I, weary, often have I to endure in the sea path. The shadows of night darkened in snow from the north, frost bound to the ground, hail fell from the earth. Hardest of grains. Indeed, now they are trouble, the thoughts of my heart that I myself should strive with, the high streams, the tossing of the salt waves. The wish of my heart urges all the time my spirit to go forth that i <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> that i far from here should seek my homeland for i am among a foreign people indeed there is not so proud a spirited a man in the world nor a generous of gifts nor so bold in his youth nor so brave in his deeds nor so dear to his lord that he never wants to be this seafarer and his seafaring he has a worry as to what this lord will do to him not for him is the sound of the harp nor the giving of rings, nor the pleasure in women, nor worldly glory, nor anything at all, unless the tossing of the waves. But he always has a longing. He who strives on the waves. I long for the groves to take on blossoms. I long for the fields that are comely the towns that grow fair, 
the world seems new in these places. <clears throat> All these things urge on the eager spirit. But mine is to travel. In one who so thinks to travel far on the paths of the sea. So the cuckoo warns with a sad voice. The guardian of the Zuma sings. Bodes a sorrow grievous in the soul this the man does not know the warrior lucky in worldly things that some endure then those who tread most widely the paths of exile and now my spirit twists about my breast my spirit out in the waterways over the whale's path it soars wildly through the corners of the world it comes back to me eager and unsated urges on to the whale road an unresting heart across the waves of the sea indeed hotter for me are the joys of the lord than this dead life fleeting on the land I do not believe that the riches of the world will stand forever. Always and invariably one of three things will turn to uncertainty before his fated hour. Disease or old age or sword's hatred will tear out the life from the doom to die. And so it is for each man the praise of the living for those who speak afterwards that the best epitaph that he should work before he must be gone bravely in the world against the anonymity and the enemies of the evil daring deeds against a fiend so that the sons of men will praise him afterwards and his fame afterwards would live with the spirits and forever and ever the glory of eternal life and the joy of the summer hosts the days are gone the days are gone of all the glory of the kingdoms of this middle earth there are not now kings nor caesars nor givers of gold as once they were when they, the greatest amongst themselves, performed various deeds and with the most lordly majesty, majesty lived. All the old guard is gone, the revellers are over, the weaker ones now dwell and hold on to the world, enjoying it through their sweat. The glory is fled, Notabil the notability of the world ages and grows sere, as now does every man through the world age makes upon him for the upper world and the upper earth and the lower earth age comes upon him his faith face grows pale the gray beard laments he knows that his old friends the sons of princes have given been given to the earth his body fails them his life leaves him he cannot taste sweetness nor feel pain nor move his hand nor think with his head though he would stew the grave of, with gold a brother of his kinsmen buried with the dead massive treasure it just won't work nor can the soul with which is full not preserve the gold before the fear of the gods though he hid it before while he is yet alive Great is the fear of the Lord before which the world stands still. He established the firm foundations and the corners of the world and the high heavens. A fool is one who does not fear the darkness. Death comes to him who is unprepared. Blessed is he who humbly looks forward to the light. that God set that spirit within him because he believed man must control his passions and keep everything in balance keep faith with men and pure of wisdom each man must be even-handed with their friends and foes 
though he does not wish him in the foulness of flames, nor the pyre or the cold of the frost and snow. Let us ponder where we have our homes and think, for mine is lost and my advice to you how we should get to thither and then we should all strive that we might go there that the belonging of the life the joy of the heavens and those that adore us for for me they are all gone but in the eyes of the summer they come back thank you <laughs>